six lessons at 45 minutes is four and a half hours. Four and a half hours, we're going to try to cover 22 chapters of Revelation. Uh, as always, I've probably planned too much, um, but we'll see how it goes. Today is an introductory lesson, uh, so thank you for being here. I've been working on this for a while to help uh, the people who got it, Zion Luther the Church, get their hands around this uh, mysterious book. Uh, Advent season is coming. We focus on Christ's return, and so uh, the book of Revelation is a worthy focus for us. Uh, there are two handouts. If you're a couple, I'd ask that you share. I'll print more next week, uh, assuming you all come back after today. Um, so one is, says just lesson one. It's double-sided. Uh, there's another one that's got some pretty pictures on it, and that's an outline. That's something you're going to want to bring every week to orient yourself to where we're at in the book of Revelation. Uh, the class is called Revelation for the rest of us. The goal is to help you understand what's going on in Revelation at any given point. But inevitably, you're going to have questions about the minor details, some of which I will get into, uh, some of which I will not. So if we get to lesson four and you say, Pastor, what about these scorpions that could sting with their tail, but the power to kill was in their mouth? What's that all about? Ask me afterwards, because I just don't have time to talk about every little detail, but we'll just try to get a global picture of the book and what's going on. Uh, I will warn you the handouts. I, I hate doing handouts like this because you're probably reading this thing uh, before I even get to it. I would encourage you just pick it up and go with me through it as we go through. Uh, week three, you're going to pick out the handout, and some of you who have bad eyesight are going to crumple it up, throw it in the trash, and leave that day. Uh, I promise you it's not as bad as it looks. You know, we'll just go through it together, and uh, hopefully we'll have enough time in 45 minutes. I have a little countdown timer right there that reminds me to keep going. So here's the outline of the class, six lessons um, and, uh, that will go through the book of Revelation. It will become more clear how we're going to do that. Uh, we're just dividing up the book. And, and don't worry about memorizing this, but uh, what I want to tell you is each week is going to have a special focus of something that lands in that section of Revelation. So today we're going to talk a little bit about apocalyptic literature. Next week we'll talk a little bit about the rapture in quotation marks. Uh, Armageddon, Mark of the Beast, Antichrist, and the Millennium. These are all things you've probably all heard about. They're kind of in the air. And many people believe not what we believe about it. Probably many in this room, so we're going to try to clear up some confusion. I was going to have a final lesson at the end that dealt with all this uh, and try to do this in five lessons. It wasn't possible, so I decided to take these things on as they appear uh, in the text. So that'll kind of be your bait to come each week, I guess. Um, you should have a handout that looks like this. Yours is white. Uh, mine is dark. I'm going to build this out. I realize that's too small for you to see. That's why you have a handout. I'm going to build this out at the very end of today to give you an overview of the structure of Revelation. It will orient you very well for how to look at this book. Again, yours looks like that. And all we're covering today is the prologue and the commissioning vision, just chapter one. So a lot of introductory material, and then chapter one, and then we're gonna start Fast and Furious through the book next week with the seven letters for the seven churches. Okay, so the book of Revelation, we're gonna say is written by John, the son of Zebedee, the disciple whom Jesus loved, the one who was at the cross, and Jesus entrusted his mother Mary to him, uh, that's the John we're going to say wrote this book. Much of scholarship will say it was another John uh, who lived at a later time, etc., etc. Um, we would have no reason to believe that. And his book, as esoteric and wild as it is, would have found no place in the canon of the church if it didn't have apostolic authority. Um, so, again, I'm aware of all the debate around who the author is. We're going to say John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, wrote it. And he identifies himself as such which is far different from most apocalyptic literature, which is written under a pseudonym, a uh, pen name, if you will. Someone pretends to be a prophet of old. John identifies himself from the start. When does he write it? Um, probably around 90 to 95 AD. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but the title of the book is The Revelation, not Revelations, right? A little pet peeve. The Revelation, it's a single revelation of St. John, but really, really the book is better titled, if you look at the opening verses, The Revelation of Jesus Christ would be a better title for book. This is a revelation Jesus gave to John through an angel to see into the future. Um, the Greek word is apocalypse. Uh, 
which we're just we'll talk in a minute about a genre of apocalyptic literature, highly symbolic, non-literal imagery uh, to convey truths. Um, and so sometimes in some Bibles it will be called the Apocalypse of St. John. That's just a transliteration of the Greek. Um, really what that word means is a revelatory unveiling. Jesus is pulling back the curtain to the future and showing John in these visions what will pass. In that sense, it is very much a prophecy. If you're following along on your handout, it's a prophecy of the future. The date, um, we're going to say it was written during the reign of Domitian, during which there was a Christian persecution. Domitian was um, making sure that Christians would also consider the emperor himself divine and would bow their knee or uh, pinch incense to the emperor. Uh, for John, it's very clear to do that is to place yourself outside of salvation and into idolatry. And so faithful Christians were resisting, but at the cost of perhaps their life. So the whole book is really summed up like this. Jesus wins in the end. Don't bow the knee to the emperor, because then you lose in the end, okay? I mean, that's the entire book. But when you're facing death, you need some encouragement. And that's what this revelation is. It's encouragement to churches who are under persecution that don't worry about it. Even if you lose your life, you win. So even though it's a book full of violent doom and gloom, uh, it's meant to encourage the church in the midst of all that. Uh, some people argue for an earlier date of the Neronian persecution. Um, again, we, we don't have time to get into all that. I just want you to know I'm aware of it. We'll just say it was written around uh, 91 to 95 AD um, during the persecution of the Christians in Rome during Domitian's reign. Uh, a setting, again, was uh, empire-wide persecution. So how has this book been received? Well, not well in the history of the church, um, but that's not how it was at the beginning. Actually, the, Revel the book of Revelation has uh, universal attestation by all the early church fathers until about 300 years later when people started to question. Why? Because it was obscure, even to them, and thus it wasn't read as much. And because it wasn't as in much in use as the Gospels and Paul's letters, people began to question its authenticity. But that didn't really happen until later. Nevertheless, it, it, it is anti-legomena, which just means a book that has been spoken against. There are, are people in the history of the church who say, no, we're not too sure about the canonicity of this one. As opposed to homo legomena, which means you said the same thing, right? Homo, the same um, so he, 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 here's the breakdown. Hebrews, James, 2 Peter, 2 and 3 John, Jude, and Revelation have all been spoken against at one point or another. Um, all that means in our church is that we never draw our primary doctrine out of any of these books. Fortunately, there's nothing these books give us that these books don't already give us. So it's really not too big of a problem for us. But you'll hear people question Revelation, and it wasn't always so. Um, here's Luther's German New Testament. Uh, if you look here, he's got a list of 23 books, and then down at the bottom, he's got some unnumbered books, <laughs> and the bottom of which is the Revelation of John. Luther did not uh, have a lot of uh, love for it, at least at first. In fact, um, here's what he said in his preface in 1522. He says, about this book of Revelation of John, I leave everyone to hold his own opinions. I would not have anyone bound by my opinion or judgment, or I say what I feel. I miss more than one thing in this book, and it makes me consider it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. Let everyone think of it as his own spirit leads him, but my spirit cannot accommodate itself to this book. Because why? He says Christ is not taught in it. Well, I got news for Luther. <laughs> Christ is most definitely taught in it. But uh, you notice Luther is hedging on this. He's saying, I just don't love to read this book. It doesn't comfort me as much as Galatians or Romans. Uh, but I leave you to your own opinion. I don't hold you to my own. All right? He, he, he didn't see Christ as clearly in it. Now, that is true. Not as clearly. But Christ is there. However, in 1530, he softens a little. Oh, the slide's kind of little for you sitting in the back. Um, he said there's three kinds of prophecy. Instruction. Instruction with images. And then images alone. And he says Revelation's kind of images alone. And that was what we can largely agree. He said this kind of prophecy remains a mystery unless we interpret it. We have to interpret it. Um, and it says if we're going to interpret it correctly, then, then it can be prop beneficial to the church. And uh, he says, Revelation, is way too many words on the screen, fights against rationalism. 
The idea that we can just understand everything with our logic and reason. Here's a book that just blows that out of the water. And he says, that's good for the church to kind of open up our minds a little bit and realize that when we talk in logical terms about the faith, we're just, we're just trying to explain things sometimes that are unexplainable. And Revelation reminds us of that. The other thing he does is that it helps fight against the distorted perspective. You know, he says, oh, we think our age is so bad, right? And what do we say? Our age is so bad. He said, just read the book of Revelation, and you'll realize that maybe ours is really a golden age compared to how it will be someday in the future or how it's been in the past. And so he sees value in the book for that. Uh, Revelation, he says, is profitable for our comfort, right? Because nothing will suppress Christendom. In the end, we have the victory and we conquer if we hold fast. Uh, and for our warning. We should be on guard against all of those things, all Satan's forces that attack Christendom. And so he really much very sees this book as picturing the spiritual battle that happens behind the scene. Finally then, uh, Luther's reception, he says here at the end, If only the word of the gospel remains pure among us and we love and cherish it, we shall not doubt that Christ is with us, even when things are at their worst. As we see here in this book, that through and beyond all plagues, beasts, and evil angels, Christ is nonetheless with the saints and wins the final victory. So, um, you've heard that Luther didn't have much use for Revelation. It's true he said things like that, but uh, by 1530, uh, 16 years before his death, he is very much um, uh, in support of reading this book in the church and what it can give us. Lou Brighton wrote a, the CPH commentary on Revelation. It was the first one to come out in 1999. <laughs> And uh, this is from his introduction, and I thought this was worth uh, sharing. He says, My particular study of Revelation has been a lifelong vocation and pursuit. It began early on in my pastoral ministry in the 1950s in London, England, while ministering to a beloved adopted mother in Christ. On her deathbed, she asked me to read her the words of Revelation 7, 9 through 17, which we just heard on All Saints Sunday. We hear it every year. As I began reading from my King James Version, she recited them along with me from memory. At the conclusion of saying together these beautiful words, she said that tonight or tomorrow she would be with those blessed saints in heaven because, she said, I also have washed myself in the blood of the Lamb. He said, I had read those words before, but I had never focused my attention nor my faith on them, nor had I given careful consideration to Revelation for my personal study of the Bible. But that aged saint of God who closed her eyes in death by looking at her Savior through those words in Revelation motivated me, motivated me to begin a lifelong study of this last book of the Bible. For as those words of Revelation 7 were a fitting conclusion of comfort for this blessed saint as she waited for her Lord to come, they now became for me the beginning of an understanding that Revelation is the conclusion of the entire Bible. Thus began my earnest study of it. Um, in the last six months, Revelation has become... Leaps and Bounds, my favorite book of the Bible. Uh, I had tried to understand it before, and had understood it, and then it slipped out of my memory. But as I revisited it, I realized these are the last words Jesus gives us until he comes again. This is the imagery he gives us to hang on to. And yes, it can be a little difficult, but once we kind of unlock the, a basic key to understanding this book, it will bless us and sustain us in the midst of whatever uh, is to come our way. And so we thank Dr. Brighton for the path he blazed in our synod with this book um, and for everything he gave us. Now, there are different ways to read Revelation. I'm on point D in your outline if you're following along. Um, some of this is technical terminology. It's not too hard. Preterist just means past tense, okay? Uh, preterists believe everything in this book was fulfilled before 400 AD. All of it is in the past. Nothing of it is yet to come. All right? Uh, then there's historicists who believe that uh, events are being fulfilled in history, or maybe they've mostly already been fulfilled, but we're, we're sort of watching history for it to unfold, and we're looking for events. Then there are futurists. Um, many, many people who today in the church, especially in North America, are committed futurists. Everything in Revelation is describing something that's going to happen whenever Jesus comes again. It's like we're on pause until the events of Revelation kick in. Right? Finally, there's idealists, and you see I have that underlined. That would probably best represent our tradition of understanding Revelation, that these events represent an ongoing conflict between Christ and the church, throughout human, or Satan and the church, throughout human history. Okay? Uh, 
This chart says no historical fulfillment. That's not quite right. Notice I put a little carrot in here. No single historical fulfillment. And, and yes, we're idealists, but we will read some things in Revelation that are clearly going to happen in the future. We'll read some things in Revelation that clearly already happened in John's day in the Roman Empire. And like historicists, we're going to see that throughout history, things Revelation predicts come true. But they might not just come true once, they might come true again and again and again. Uh, every Babylon was not just the Roman Empire in the early church, it, it might be America today, right? Any empire who suppresses the truth and righteousness. So, uh, we are idealists, but really there's flavors of all of this as we interpret Revelation. But one thing we do not do is read Revelation as if it is a series of news bites from the future that we're looking to match up. And that is going to be directly opposite of how most of your friends in North American Christianity, right? What's happening now? A war in Israel. I can't tell you how many times people have asked me, is this Armageddon, Pastor? Well, it's no more Armageddon than the last time there was a war in Israel. Okay? Um, so, that's not how we read this. But you see, many in the church have. They've, they've looked at the series of seven seals that we'll study later, and they line it up with periods of church history. Or uh, the seven trumpets, you know, one was the fall of Jerusalem, one the fall of Rome, then papal dominion, then the French Revolution. It's not how we read the book. Uh, we had four blood moons recently, you remember that? It's all the rage, buy these books, look, the end is coming. Well, yes, atmospheric signs are a sign that the end is coming, but these things have always happened in the history of the world. They're reminders that Jesus is coming again soon, but they're not harbingers that it's going to happen right now. Uh, people look at you know one world order, uh, one currency, global currency, and they see in this uh, signs of revelation. Again, we are not trying to tie ourselves to specific historical events, but to see patterns that play out. Um, a few other examples of books you can pick up at your local Christian bookstore. Uh, all of them are a little misguided. So um, here's kind of the general approach here. Revelation unveiled, we're unveiling, okay, that's kind of an approach, or... This is the book of Revelation about victory through the Lamb. We're going to say, this is what we want to get out of Revelation. That the Lamb, in the end, uh, is victorious. Okay, are we doing on time? Good. Today, we're going to, our special focus uh, is apocalyptic literature. I've already talked a little bit about that. Um, apocalyptic literature is marked by extensive use of images or visions. Dragons, multi-horned beasts, um, you name it, it's in there. Scorpions that sting with a tail. Uh, obviously, uh, these are not meant to be read literally. And yet, uh, a big mistake in the book of Revelation is people enforcing a literal interpretation on a genre of scripture that doesn't ask to be read literally. So oftentimes, I'll get accused by a Baptist friend in the history of my life saying, you want to interpret Jesus' words at the Last Supper, this is my body, this is my blood, literally, which by the way they don't, it's just symbolic. But then you Lutherans turn around and get to the book of Revelation and say everything is symbolic. You know, you're inconsistent. To which I would say back, well, if you insist on reading everything in Revelation literally, why don't you take Jesus' words at the Last Supper literally? Well, that's different, they would say. <laughs> No, what I would really say is this. Jesus is giving his last will and testament of the Lord's Supper. These are the last words he gives to the disciples before he marches to his death. And he's bequeathing them to a meal, his very body and blood that's going to feed the church until he comes again. Jesus knew words like symbolizes, represents. He knew all those words and he said, this is my body, this is my blood. So we take him at his word because why wouldn't we? On the other hand, you get to the book of Revelation, and it's clearly written in apocalyptic style. Why is it written that way? Well, John is writing a letter to seven churches back on the mainland who are undergoing persecution. That letter has to get to the mainland. It might be intercepted by Roman authorities. If he spells everything out in black and white, he's going to increase their persecution on him and maybe invite his death. He's writing a letter in cryptic language that the people who received it at the time would have understood because they knew their Old Testament. 
And they would have interpreted this and understood what John was trying to tell them, and it would have sounded like gibberish to Roman authorities. And unfortunately, 2,000 years later, sometimes it sounds like gibberish to the church. But John chooses the genre of his writing um, for a very specific reason. Further, these visions and symbols and imagery speak not just to our head like a letter from Paul, but to our heart. You, you, know, you see a dragon pursuing a woman in the wilderness, and you're alarmed for the sake of the church during this time of persecution. That's a lot different than just saying the church will be persecuted, right? You see it in your mind's eye of what's happening. You see a picture of it. And so Revelation is meant to speak not just to our heads, uh, but to our heart. And certainly that's true of all scripture. But apocalyptic literature heightens that. Um, eh, you don't need that chart. So uh, pretty much everything in the book of Revelation is an Old Testament image recycled. For John's purposes. Daniel, Ezekiel, Zechariah, you will find images in all the pages of these books in Revelation. In fact, some scholars have counted uh, 579 allusions to the Old Testament in Revelation. Now why that's remarkable is there's only 404 total verses in the book of Revelation. John never quotes an Old Testament passage exactly like you see in Matthew or Paul, where it's a direct quotation. But the allusions to the images are prevalent. And that's why you're going to see in these handouts that are going to look very busy, uh, on the right-hand side, I am going to have grayed out so that it doesn't look too busy, the references where these are from. And if you wanted to do this when you got home because you're a sharp student or something, you could go through this handout again and look up all those passages and see how this is true. Now, there are times I will point your attention to a specific allusion from the Old Testament so that you can appreciate it and see it. I could not do that every time or we'd be here until Easter, okay? So I just don't have that amount of time. But just know that John is just basically borrowing the Old Testament that his people would have known and reusing it to communicate a new message today. Uh, there's a lot of numbers in Revelation. They are never, ever meant to be taken literally. Um, they are figurative numbers. For instance, 144,000. Right? If you're a Jehovah's Witness, that means that only 144,000 people are saved. And as I would like to say to the next one that knocks on my door, I'm sorry, I think those slots have already been taken. You're wasting your time with me. <laughs> now, there's a reason for that number. 12 uh, is the number of the church and the people of God. You had 12 tribes in the Old Testament. You had 12 disciples in the New. This is not hard math. 12 times 12 is... 144. 1,000 is a number of perfection or completion. When John says he sees 144,000 sealed, what he's saying is all the Old Testament and New Testament church are being protected by God and their faith. Right? Um, so again, that's just one example. So four is usually a number of the earth. Seven uh, is God's number. Or the, when the beast tries to mimic God, he employs the number seven. Six is going to be just shy of perfection. That's always going to be the, the number of evil. Remember, 666, the mark of the beast. Um, we'll get there eventually. Uh, 10, again, fullness or multiplicity. So we, we, we need to know that as we get into the book. We'll encounter those numbers as we go along. Finally, uh, again, small chart I know, the literary structure of Revelation. Revelation is not a book that's written chronologically, uh, starting in a certain time and just plowing through time until the end. Um, like this, like when we get to the seals and the trumpets and the bowls in a couple weeks, it's not marching left to right through history, all right? That's, that's what like Left Behind series and Late Great Planet Earth, this is how they read the book of Revelation. And um, it's kind of crazy because the world ends at the, at the end of each of those cycles. So either the world is destroyed and rebuilt three times and we start over, or, or what we would say is the seals, the trumpets, the woman and the dragon, the bulls, they're all representing the same period of time. We go through it once from a certain angle. And we go through it again, looking at it just a little differently. And then again. Um, and, and that's how we're going to read the book of Revelation, because that's how it, that's how most serious scholars read the book and readers of it. Um, so that'll become more apparent as we go throughout. But that, that style of reading is seeing Revelation uh, not as a chronological book, but as cyclical, or if you want the fancy word, recapitulation. It happens again, but uh, in a more intense way, uh, from a different angle, etc. 
Um, and that will become clear as we go through the outline at the end. So um, I'm just going to stop right here uh, because we're about to get into the prologue in Chapter 1. And I'll just say any questions based on the things I've been blabbing out about or that you want to clarify. All right, that's all I'm going to do, by the way, of introduction. Um, about the book. I think that's, those are the highlights. And again, if you have questions, uh, I've been reading a lot on this, ask me before it disappears from my brain forever. So. All right, now I think the best thing to do would be to have your Bible open on one side and your, um, your handout on the other. I'm not sure quite how this is going to work <laughs> or how long this is going to take. Um, so maybe, maybe today I can get away with actually reading the text because we're not trying to get through that much of it. I don't think that's going to work in future weeks. By the way, uh, yeah, let me just say this. We're probably trying to cover too much in 45 minutes. If I had an hour, I'd feel a lot better, but we just don't. So we're probably not going to read through the actual text in class and talk about what the text means. I'm probably just going to talk about what the text means. And that means if you haven't encountered it before, you might, you might get a little lost. The best way to approach this class, and again, I know you're busy people and you're not, you, know, you don't get paid to read the Bible like I do, but um, look at the, the sections where if you would read that before you came to class, two or three chapters, maybe four, you would have it in your brain. Then when we encounter it, you'll remember that. And then, once we've talked about it and explained it, go home that Sunday or Monday and read it again with your newfound knowledge. And that would be a way to help this stick with you. Uh, there's only 22 chapters, six weeks. So the commitment is not that much. But I'm just saying, if you visit the text in advance, I think it will help you as you encounter it. All right. I got 18 minutes to go. All right. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants. By the way, I'm reading ESV, so if it drives you nuts to have a different translation, get an ESV Bible. Uh, the things that must soon take place. The things that must soon take place. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what soon means in a minute. But uh, obviously this book is primarily oriented toward the future. Uh, he made it known by sending an angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Uh, and here comes the first of seven Beatitudes in the book, and we'll count these as we go through the weeks. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. All right. John is saying that if we study and read this book as we wait for Jesus to come again, we will be blessed. Not that we'll prosper, but that we will have a better understanding and orientation as to how we are to live in respect to the world around us. So what do we need to do? We need to hear these words and keep, keep what is written in them. Now, again, there are seven Beatitudes that flow throughout the book, and I just want to point out a couple of things about them. Uh, blessed is the front one who hears the words of this prophecy and keeps it. Now look at the letter E down there. Uh, way at the end of the book, in chapter 22, John reiterates this. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. That tells us that John's main hope for us here is that through seeing these images of Revelation, that we would, it would help us hold on to the truth and not be led astray. That we would keep it. Because pretty much everything that we're going to encounter is going to be things that are causing us to veer away, to not keep it. Also look at uh, letters B and F. Uh, these kind of go together too. Uh, B, blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on so that he might not be exposed. Do you remember the parable of the feast where the man comes in and then he gets kicked out because he doesn't have the right clothes on? Right? That's what John's talking about here. All right? uh, we need to be clothed in the deeds of life that accompany our faith. Uh, otherwise, we're, we're, we're disrobing ourselves and keeping ourselves apart from the promise. We're exposed to Satan and his work. Uh, similarly, the last 
beatitude. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life. That does not say blessed are those whose robes have been washed by Jesus. As we Lutherans would like to say, oh, see, Jesus washed my robe in the blood of his blood and made them white. No. Uh, John here puts the impetus on us. Wash your robes. He's not talking about forgiveness here. He's talking about living the life you've been called to live in the face of the adversity of the world. So that's, that's the bookend focus, and these are the Beatitudes that, that flow uh, throughout this book. Okay, then we get to this Trinitarian greeting. Uh, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. So the first and primary recipients of this letter John writes are the seven churches in Asia. And we're going to look at the letters he writes to them next week. But he begins by saying, Grace to you and peace, which is how letters begin, from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, who is that? That's the Father in heaven, right? That's Yahweh. That's the one at the burning bush who says, I am who I am, or I is who I is. I was, and I am, and I am to come. I'm the eternal one. Right? That's the Father uh, connoting his eternality, that he is the Lord of all history. The beginning, he's there, and at the end, he'll be there. He controls it all. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, who are the seven spirits before his throne? Uh, this is a little confusing because you would be like, I don't know, it sounds like seven beings. But really, uh, it's a way that John talks about the Holy Spirit. It's an allusion to Isaiah 11 uh, because there in Isaiah 11 are the seven gifts of the Spirit that he will pour out. So by saying the seven spirits who are before the throne of God, it's his way of alluding to uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, how else we know that is because then, of course, he saves Jesus for last and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. Jesus is the one who did not, did not back down from his testimony in the face of death. See? That's what now they're being asked to do. He's the firstborn of the dead. What's John telling them? Even if you die like Jesus did, guess what? You'll be raised like Jesus was. And then finally, he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. That means no matter what you think is going on in the world and who you think's in charge, don't be deceived. Your God is the one who's truly in charge. And so a uh, great and precious promise is being poured out to the people in Asia Minor in the midst of their persecution here from the, the very beginning of the book. Uh, he's freed us by his blood to be a kingdom of priests. Uh, this is what... The Bible has always said, right, that Israelites were brought out of Egypt, right, to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Peter writes that we're a priesthood of all believers. We are now the ministers, the hands and feet of God on the ground. That's the point of our being free. Uh, and then here's an announcement of his return. Behold, he's coming soon, and every eye will see him. Every eye will see. It won't be some secret rapture, right? Uh, no one's going to miss when Jesus comes again. Uh, everyone will look on him, even those who pierced him. That means believers and unbelievers. Uh, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end, and thus he's going to be the rightful judge of all history. Now the commissioning vision. Um, uh, I'll just read from 1-9 on. I, John, your brother and partner in tribulation in the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on an island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Okay? So John is in prison on an island because he is leading the church and they don't like it. So he's being persecuted for his faith. But guess what? It's Sunday. What does a Christian do on Sunday, even in prison? Worships. In the midst of his little private worship service, right, he's caught up in the spirit and given this vision and told to write down everything he sees and send it to the churches. By the way, yes, it is for those seven churches, but it's also, as we'll see next week, to all churches of all time who are to receive this message. Verse 12, then I turned to see the voice of what was speaking to me, and turning, I saw... 
Oh, by the way, here's John on the island of Patmos. I forgot to put that picture up. By the way, most of what I show on the screen in future weeks is just going to be imagery, with the exception of next week. Images I found that are the best ones that depict maybe sort of what John was seeing. But here's the inaugural uh, commissioning vision. I saw uh, someone was standing in the midst of uh, seven golden lampstands, and one was like the Son of Man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, like snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the shining sun in all its strength. Okay, um, here on your handout, I have some kind of some notes as to what these things might depict. Um, the gold lampstands, we're told in verse 20, represent the churches. So Jesus is standing in the midst of his churches. What a comforting vision this is. He's not absent from what's going on. He's right there in the midst of them. Um, he, he's dressed like a priest would have been in the Old Testament with a sash and a, and a robe. Uh, he's in his priestly role. He's interceding for the saints. He's ministering to them. Uh, his white hair like wool and snow. Again, those are images from this uh, Son of Man in Daniel 7. John borrows those images and brings them in. Uh, he's the Ancient of Days from Daniel 7. He's the one worthy of respect and honor. He's the one with all wisdom. His eyes penetrate. They see everything. His eyes can destroy evil. They know what's going on. They purify all that they encounter. Uh, his feet are like burnished bronze. He has the necessary strength to stomp on and conquer his enemies. His voice is like the roar of many waters. Have you ever stood next to a roaring waterfall? Just the rush. That's what John experienced, right? And I put there, I didn't misspell that. I did that on purpose. The awe, O majesty of God. Now, you could take that dash out if you're not a believer. It's an awful majesty. It's there to destroy. But if you're a believer, you just stand in the midst of this awe, this, this voice. The seven stars in his right hand are the angels or messengers. Um, angels, almost every other place in the book of Revelation means actual angels. But angels... It's just messengers, and here it's the, the, the pastors of the seven churches, the ones ministering over them. He holds them in his hand. Those pastors probably feel like they have no one in their corner right now, but they're, they're held in Jesus' hand. Not just any hand, his right hand, which we know is his hand of mercy, that he brings comfort and strength. A two-edged sword comes from his mouth. He will execute judgment by means of his word on all his enemies, and his face shines like the sun. Just like at the transfiguration, you can't look upon it. Jesus dwells in unapproachable light. So there's this awesome, awesome vision of God. And what does John do in verse 17? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Like everyone else in the Bible who saw the presence of God, uh, the first thing they think is, I'm a dead man. Because that's what you'd think if you stood in the presence of God. But Jesus is not here to bring wrath or fear. What are the first words out of Jesus' mouth? The number one thing Jesus says in all of Scripture, fear not. Fear not. Places his right hand on John and says, don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. Yes, I was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore. And now guess what? I hold the keys to death and Hades. If you're being strengthened by the one whose right hand is on your shoulder telling you not to be afraid, and he has the keys to your worst enemies, you don't need to be afraid anymore. Uh, a pastor friend of mine who couldn't be at my ordination, but you know, you usually lay a hand on a pastor and read a verse. Uh, he couldn't be there that day, but he wrote me a nice email and says, this is what I would say to you. And he shared this verse here, fear not, I, I am alive. I hold the keys to death and hate you. Now, every time I get a chance to do an ordination, spoiler alert, this is the verse I read. I can't think of a better thing to do as we're laying our hands on that pastor and speaking to him. Fear not. Now, what comes next is really important. Here's what he tells John to write. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen. He's talking about this vision right here that John has now written for us. Write what you've seen. Those things that are, we're going to say that's, that's the letter to the seven churches. 
what's going on right now in these churches, those things that are, and then finally, those things that are to take place after this. Because once he finishes writing to the seven churches, the entire rest of the book is a prophecy about future events that will happen sometime between ascension, when Jesus leaves us, and Jesus' return when he comes back. Okay? So write those things that you have seen, that are, and that are to take place after this. And this is where I'd like you to turn your attention to, I'm just telling John to write whatever he's seeing. Um, you can't read that, I know, but I'm going to build this nonetheless. And I'd like you to follow along either, either on this or on your, on your lesson one handout, the back side. Whichever you prefer. This is just meant to be something you can bring each week and kind of orient yourself to where we're at. We'll always start with where we're at in the outline. So the things that you have seen, John is commissioned. He sees an initial vision, which we have just looked at with him. This son of man standing among the churches, the victorious one, the one who controls the keys to the future. All right? So there's John getting his vision on the island of Patmos. The things that are. Next week when we gather together, we're going to look at a message he writes to seven churches. He's going to rail at five of these churches for things that are going on in their midst. Uh, Revelation, as we'll see, is not a book about us versus them. If you're on the church, you're on the good side. If you're on the dragon side, you're on the bad side. That is a struggle that's playing out, but just as important as the struggle that plays out inside of every soul, and that includes those inside the church, because we individually and as congregations are called to conquer over the Lamb, and, or over Satan, and not forfeit the promises. Um, and so he's going to tell these churches what they need to straighten up in order to not lose their reward. And so we're going to look at those letters. We're going to kind of think about, hmm, if John were writing to us today, which of these letters might be most appropriate for us? It should be uncomfortable. It's meant to be. Uh, blessed are those who will read the prophecy of this book and think about it. Uh, then we're also going to talk about this inaugural vision. Uh, next week, Jesus sees a lamb looking as though he'd been slain. Who's that? Jesus. And there's a scroll that has the prophecy of the future. And John is crying because nobody can open the scroll except the lamb who's been slain. He has the power to open the scroll. And so the third week when we get together then, we're going to begin to see what was in that scroll of prophecy that was written. And here, here is the key to understanding Revelation. In this prophecy are three cycles that depict the events from ascension to Christ's return. They're not chronological. There are three things happening at the same time. So first, we'll see seven seals of that letter unfold. All right? And this is going to show us the suffering human beings cause each other in this period that we're waiting for Jesus. And then each series of seven has what we'll call an interlude. Kind of a time out. Stop looking over here. Like I said in the sermon last week. Stop looking at all this doom and gloom in these seals. And look over here instead. And that's when John sees that multitude in white robes. So what does that tell us? Right? These people are sealed by God. They have these great promises for them. In the midst of the doom and gloom going on, depicted by these seals, four horsemen of the apocalypse. We'll get into all that next week. You should see the church over here being protected and watched over by God. That's one cycle of seven. Uh, then uh, we'll see another cycle of seven, right? Seven trumpets that will blast and show us things of the future. Terrible things. Things that we don't want to look at. But in the midst of those, we look over again and we see two witnesses speaking the word of God in the midst of all this turmoil. And yes, they're put to death, but they stand back up again. And this means that, that the church, the mission of the church, the word will continue to be proclaimed in the midst of the devastation around them, and it will be vindicated in the end. God's people will be protected. By the way, the second cycle of seven, we'll talk about it then, suffering evil human, or uh, how God uses fallen creation as an instrument of his judgment. So how our world suffers because of sin. Then, uh, in the midst of all this, in the midst of these three cycles of seven is a, an interlude to the whole book. That'll be lesson four. We'll see uh, the dragon pursuing this woman and her child. 
And that's probably the key lesson of the whole thing. By the way, lesson three is going to have way too much because we're also going to try to cover the third cycle of seven. So we're going to do these in lesson three, and then we'll back up and take this interlude of this woman uh, on our own. The seven bowls, then, are just God's final judgment poured out on human beings before he comes again. Okay? But again, the point is, these are not seals, trumpets, bowls. It's, let's look at the history of the world through this lens, <coughs> human suffering. Let's look at the world through this lens of the world suffering. And let's look at the world through this end lens, how God pours out his judgment on his people. Not on his people, but on the world from which we will be saved. Uh, again, in the midst of all that is another picture of uh, a woman representing the church being protected from the attacks of the dragon. Finally, then, we'll take two lessons to look at the end and close up. Again, I hope you're looking at your sheet because I know you can't see this. Um, uh, at the end, when Jesus returns, the first thing he will do is judge and overthrow the dragon's forces. You will learn who those forces are, but just here, uh, the prostitute, who he will throw into the lake of fire, she represents the apostate church. And uh, Babylon will be thrown into the lake of the fire. Those are the political rulers, the political rulers who mislead people and persecute the church. They will be done away with. Then a victory celebration will commence, a marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. So that's the first look at the end. Then we'll come back for a final lesson just before Christmas, and we'll look at the end close-up part two. Now the dragon, Satan himself, gets thrown into the lake of fire, and then we see a picture of a new heavens and a new earth that's ushered in uh, forever and ever. And then finally, there's a short epilogue to the book. So this is the master outline by which we will orient ourselves each week. We'll take it a step at a time, and we'll look at the things that are to come so that we will be blessed through reading this book. All right, I have, look at that, that timer thing is great. Um, I'll finish with the central message. Thank you for listening to me. Um, let's just look at the bottom here. This is what I want you to keep in mind. Um, here is the central message of Revelation. I want you to look at the verse in the middle of these two small cap statements. In verse 12, 11, it says, They have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb. Yes, we know we conquer by Jesus' blood, and though by the word of their testimony. These churches were not saved just because Jesus died for them. They were saved because Jesus died for them and gave them faith, and they did not back down from their testimony of Jesus in the face of persecution. So, what is the message of the book? First, have hope. Through intense trial and suffering, the church on earth will be victorious over Satan and his evil forces. And they will conquer by the blood of the Lamb, who will give us the final victory. That is true. But so is what's below the verse. To share in this blessing, we must not fall prey to Satan's temptation. We must conquer by remaining steadfast in God's word. That's why this... Prophecy begins with letters John will write to the churches. And he's going to show them, each of them, how they need to be better about being faithful to the testimony of Jesus in their own lives. So that's what we'll pick up with next week. Seven letters. And we'll also see Jesus enthroned as the Lord of all history. And unwrap that scroll. That'll take us through the rest of the lessons. All right. Lesson one is done. Thank you for coming.